Okay, so this video for sure, I've only got like three slides left and we will be done, I promise, with chapter one. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to get through the second chapter as well. Uh, John Dewey's art as experience. At least we're going to get through uh, the uh, not so short extract from this textbook for our course. And um, anyway, so let me get the uh, PowerPoint going here. We're actually going to repeat. Uh, a little bit from our last uh, video. We'll kind of start where we left off, but back up just a little bit, right, with this this quote here. Um, and the next slide is a pretty pretty long quote, um, but it, it kind of piggybacks off of this one. So let's read this, and then we're going to, like I promise you, we'll get to chapter two shortly. Chapter two is is more of a general theory of experience and what, what Dewey means by you know, what does he mean when he says, uh, you know, we have an experience? What is an experience in general? What's an aesthetic experience? We'll get a lot more details about that uh, later on in this video. But again, still some unfinished business here uh, from chapter one, the live creature. Okay, so I'm going to reread again this uh, quote that we already covered in the last video. And this will be sort of the springboard uh, from which we start. Art is thus prefigured in the very processes of living. A bird builds its nest and a beaver its dam when internal organic pressures cooperate with external materials so that the former are fulfilled and the latter are transformed in a satisfying culmination. We may hesitate to apply the word art since we doubt the presence of directive intent, that all deliberation, all conscious intent, grows out of things once performed organically through the interplay of natural energy. So this is true of art as it is of any other thing. All, all things that, it, that require deliberation, the artist deliberating over how he's going to create, you know, his sculpture, how she's going to paint her painting or whatever. All of this deliberation is the result of something that was once not deliberative, something that was once organic, just like the beaver building a dam or the bird building the nest, they just do it, okay? Uh, and, and, and later a theory develops in response to that. Now this is something hard to swallow maybe, so he elaborates uh, and he kind of tries to back it up a bit. He says, if this were not so, art would be built on quaking sands, nay, on unstable air. The distinguishing contribution of man is consciousness of the relations found in nature. So he, he's going to admit, okay, that when we're making art, this is it's a different from the, the beaver building a dam and the bird building a nest in one regard, right? The distinguishing contribution of man is consciousness of the relations found in nature. Through consciousness, he converts the relations of cause and effect that are found in nature into the relations of means and consequence. What's the difference, right? Cause and effect versus means and consequence. So what, what, what's the distinction, right? Cause and effect, an animal might have a basic understanding of that, right? I've been near that fiery thing before. I'm not going near it. It hurts. It's painful, right? But man is able to think about this as means and consequence, right? Oh, I can use that for this, this goal, this outcome, this aim, this telos, right? To use the um, Aristotelian term, right? The Greek term, telos. What was mere shock becomes an invitation, right? So that shock of nature, that burn of the fire, now becomes an invitation to create, to use. Resistance becomes something to be used in changing existing arrangements of matter. Smooth facilities become agencies for executing an idea. In these operations, an organic stimulation becomes the bearer of meanings and motor responses are changed into instruments of expression and communication. No longer are they mere means of locomotion and direct reaction. So not, this is not, don't be confused here. You know, I don't think Dewey's not saying that when we're creating art, it is a purely theoretical you know, uh, sort of endeavor, not at all, right? He's already said, we talked about this earlier videos, you know, art differs from science in that regard. It, it's, it's, a, it's the manner of the creation is more direct and, and I'm not gonna dwell on that much here because he comes back to it. We've already talked about it before. Um, but here in this quote, right? Uh, he's talking about the development of human consciousness, our ability to deal with cause and effect and to see them as 
you know, the relations of cause and effect as instrumental. And again, he's a pragmatist. You can look up that philosophy if you want and you know more about it. Uh, but in this regard, right, we're, we're pragmatic as a species. We're able to use things that were once um, obstacles, in, you know, as implements, right, as instruments for our designs. And this is the birth of the artistic in man. Apart from relations of cause and effect in nature, conception and invention could not be. Right? This is a pretty bold claim, right? So the fact that we can recognize cause and effect in nature is what allows us to conceive and invent. Apart from the relation of processes of rhythmic conflict and fulfillment in animal life, experience would be without design and pattern. We've already talked about this before in previous videos, so I won't dwell on it here, but again, there's always this conflict and fulfillment, and for Dewey, this is the seed of aesthetic experience. Apart from organs inherited from animal ancestry, idea and purpose would be without a mechanism of realization. Right. So we wouldn't, you know, if it weren't for all these trials and errors of the past, dealing with fire, dealing with the elements and able to harness those powers, we wouldn't be artists. Right. And so this intercourse with nature and this reflective um, um, reaction to the conflict within nature and our dealing with it and the consciousness that arises as a result of this interplay of ourselves and our environment is again the basis for the possibility of artistic expression and aesthetic experience. So for Dewey, he's gonna make this pretty bold claim, art is the living and concrete proof that man is capable of restoring consciously and thus on the plane of meaning, the union of sense, need, impulse and action, characteristic of the live creature the intervention of consciousness adds regulation power of selection and redisposition so we're able to harness these elements we find in nature these relations of cause and effect we harness them we channel them through these mediums these artistic medians mediums sorry media in order to express something right and and, and this expression is a fulfillment or accumulation of an activity you know, that brings us this aesthetic uh, enjoyment, right? This fulfillment, this unity. But its intervention also leads in time, right? The intervention of consciousness, of human consciousness, right? Um, because of it, uh, sorry, I back up a bit. I almost skipped this part. Um, the intervention of consciousness adds regulation, power of selection, redisposition, and thus it varies the arts in ways without end. Because of Humans varied experience through different environments, different geographical regions, all the different types of human striving and thriving through all of our existence. This has led to a multiplicity of ways to express ourselves, right? So it varies the arts in ways without end. But its intervention also leads in time to the idea of art as a conscious idea. We're aware of art as art, right? As a human institution. And for Dewey, he says, this is the greatest intellectual achievement in the history of humanity. So he has a quite, you know, he's got quite a, um, you know, elevated view of the arts. Uh, like most of these philosophers we looked at, I, I guess maybe I'm forgetting one, but it seems to me like Plato is the only one. He seems to stand alone, uh, in, at least in this course, uh, as someone who's very suspicious of the arts, right? That they're imitative and not, you know, further removed from truth and reality. There's some some a lower form of, of, of the real. But all these thinkers, Dewey's included here, obviously, um, all of the thinkers we've looked at so far, they seem to disagree with Plato and they, they, they elevate art on this higher plane for different reasons, right? You know, for Dewey, it seems to be sort of this biological evolutionary reason, right? Our sophistication, deal with our environment, and our ability to sort of take those, 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 those very short, sweet moments of repose and to represent them in these wonderful works of art, right? That, that bring that home to everybody who, who sees them. Okay, so now we're finally done with chapter one. So thanks for sticking through. Um, that was a lot of stuff. Now that we're on to chapter two, this is actually going to go a lot faster. 
and there's a lot of repetition here, right? So he draws from the first chapter a lot. So if you understood what was come so far, uh, the next stuff that follows should, should kind of fit right in, right? He's expanding here in chapter two on his conception of experience, right? What is experience? And it seems like he's focusing on certain things and he's calling them experience. And then, he's, you know, but then he talks about experience in a more general sense. So it gets very confusing. And I think the second chapter here is, is, is a way of him trying to um, specify, to clear things up, be a little bit more uh, precise with his, uh, his language and his conception of what he means by experience per se and what makes aesthetic experience so unique and special. <clears throat> so right at the beginning of the chapter, he writes, experience occurs continuously because the interaction of live creature and environing conditions is involved in the very process of living. So in a certain sense, we're always having an experience. Okay? Under conditions of resistance and conflict, aspects and elements of the self and the world that are implicated in this interaction qualify experience with emotions and ideas so that conscious intent emerges right so this should all be a bit of a review right the living organism lives in an environment in which there's resistance conflict there's elements and aspects of the self and the world around the self that are implicated in this interaction and they give our experience a sort of feel, a, a, a sort of um, gestalt. There's emotion and ideas uh, that emerge from all this interaction. But oftentimes, he says, and this is sort of like you know, him saying, well, it's not always the case. In, in, in a certain sense, we're not having an experience always, right? Not all experience is this way. There are some times when we're not really having an experience. Oftentimes, however, Although we might use the term experience, the experience that we have is inchoate, right? Things are experienced, but not in such a way that they are composed into an experience. There is distraction and dispersion. What we observe and what we think, what we desire and what we get are at odds with each other. We put our hands to the plow and turn back. We start, then we stop. Not because the experience has reached the end for the sake of which it was initiated, but because of extraneous interruptions or of inner lethargy, right? So, right, I've just got this photograph here kind of to be silly of you know, these kids in the classroom, you know, not paying attention to the lecture, right? I think this is kind of what he has in mind. They're, 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 they're obviously, you know, experiencing life or they're living and they're part of an environment, but it's not really, everything's in co as he puts it, right? Um, they're just bored. They're, they're kind of like, you know, looking for distractions. They're not really focused on the lecture. Uh, there's not like a sense of tension and culmination, right? It's just sort of a sluggish, sort of slow, kind of docile, you know, marking the clock and ticking by, right? Doesn't have those features of experience that he focused on um, so much in the last chapter, which he drew um, aesthetic experience from. So in contrast with such an experience, we have an experience when the material experience runs its course to fulfillment, then and only then is it integrated within and demarcated in the general stream of experience from other experiences. A piece of work is finished in a way that is satisfactory. A problem receives its solution. A game is played through. Such an experience is a whole and carries with it its own individualizing quality and self-sufficiency. It is an experience. Right? So this is always the mark of an experience. It has this unity, this completion, this, this satisfaction, right? This overcoming, this, this running of the course, this, 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 this sense of fulfillment. The problem receives a solution, right? The piece of work is satisfactory. Now, philosophers, even empirical philosophers, who, who people oftentimes will kind of equate with the pragmatists. They see, they see the American pragmatists like Dewey and, and James and, and Peirce. They see these guys as basically empiricists, right? There's subtle differences, though. There's obviously a lot of agreement. So he's going to say even empirical philosophers. They've spoken for the most part of experience at large. So they're looking at experience 
at large, even this boring dull, not paying attention, right? They're looking at it as this generic term, almost like we were talking about in the previous video about the way Kant talks about space and time. But Dewey's wanted to, he wants to push back on this. He says, idiomatic speech, however, refers to experience, experiences, each of which is singular, having its own beginning and end. For life is no uniform, uninterrupted march or flow. It is a thing of histories, each with its own plot, its own inception and movement towards its course, each having its own particular rhythmic movement, each with its own unrepeated quality, pervading it throughout. So we talked a bit about this also in the previous video about human, the human being's relation with time, right? It's not like experience is just this undifferentiated thing. Experience has episodes. It has moments. It has a thrill. It has boredom. It has doldrums. It has completion of a course. Right? I, I finished this semester. I get that grade. I finished my degree. I graduated from high school. I got married. Right? There's, there's these sort of, you know, the, the relationship ended, the relationship begins, right? All these sort of things um, make up what we really typically mean when we refer to experience idiomatically. In such experiences, each successive part flows freely without seam and without unfilled blanks into what ensues. At the same time, there was no sacrifice of the self identity of the parts. A river, as distinct from a pond, flows. But its flow gives a definiteness and interest to its successive portions greater than exist in the homogeneous portions of a pond. In an experience, flow is from something to something, as one part leads into another, and as one part carries on what went before. Each gains distinctness in itself. The enduring whole is diversified by successive phases that are emphases of its varied colors. Right? So when we're talking about an experience in this Deweyan sense, right, the way Dewey wants us to understand it, there are these sort of, these breaks, these pauses, okay, there are these, these episodes, there's this culmination, and each of these parts have a sort of its own sort of unique function or identity that comes together as a unity that fits together nicely. And he makes this interesting analogy between a pond and a river, right? So the pond is more homogenous. You know, think of a still pond on a, on a very still day with no wind. Right? It's just still and unified, but it doesn't have the sense of strife and completion. The river does, and yet the river has these moments of tension where the riverbanks come closer together, and there may be more, more rocks and springs and brooks, all these things, and all of these have their own little personality and their own sort of, uh, of, uh, of unique position that make the river what it is, but they all come together into this enduring whole, right? So it is an aesthetic experience for you. Because of a continuous merging, there are no holes, mechanical junctions, and dead centers when we have an experience. There are pauses, places of rest, but they punctuate and define the quality of movement. Continued acceleration is breathless and prevents parts from gaining distinction. In a work of art, Different acts, episodes, occurrences melt and fuse into unity and yet do not disappear and lose their own character as they do. Right? So we watch a play. Um, and we might find some, some scenes striking, some scenes humorous, fun, dramatic. Right? Uh, they, they build tension. They relieve tension. Each scene has its own sort of unique character. But if it's a good work of art and, it's, and, and the, the play that we watch provides an experience, an experience in the sort of uh, special sense of Dewey's, um, it's gonna have a sort of coherent whole. All the parts are gonna build off one each, uh, of, of one each other, off of one each other, one off of each other. And this development is gonna sort of reach some sort of fulfillment or accumulation uh, that's gonna be significant. And again, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a lot like that repose that we find in our lived experience and our interactions with our 
environment. So art as experience. How does this relate to thought? Obviously, one of the things we do as human beings is to think. Is it possible to have an experience in the sense that Dewey defines it? Is it possible to have an experience of thought? In a certain sense, he wants to say yes. So, you know, this might not be much of a surprise given what he's already said in chapter one. Um, we talked about this in one of the earlier lectures about the scientific man and the intellectual versus the aesthetic. And, you know, for Nietzsche, there's really not much of a difference. It's a kind of a matter of focus and a matter, a matter of rhythm, timing, and tempo. But essentially, there's a lot of parallels between intellectual reflection and thought and scientific inquiry and what we might call the aesthetic. So how does this relate to experience in general and to this notion that we've just sort of started discussing, this notion of having an experience? Well, Dewey says that in an experience of thinking, premises emerge only as a conclusion becomes manifest. So in other words, once we decide what we're trying to prove or what the sort of goal <clears throat> is that we're trying to arrive at scientifically, then we start to think of evidence, premises that might support it or give us evidence in that regard, one way or the other. The experience, like that of watching a storm reach its height and gradually subside, is one of continuous movement of subject matters. Like the ocean and the storm, there are a series of waves, suggestions reaching out and bring, being broken in a clash or being carried onwards by a cooperative wave. Right, so we, 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 we get to these conclusions, or so we get these premises that seem promising, and then we start to work them out, and they kind of lead nowhere, and then we find ones that, that lead on to other premises and other evidence, and we're getting closer and closer to our conclusion. If a conclusion is reached, it is that of a movement of anticipation and accumulation, one that finally comes to completion. A conclusion is not separate is not a separate or independent thing. It is the consummation of a movement. And for him, this is what characterizes most aesthetic uh, experience, is this, this sort of accumulation right, of, of preceding movements. So hence, an experience of thinking has its own aesthetic quality. It differs from those experiences that are acknowledged to be aesthetic, but only in its materials. The material of the fine arts consists of qualities, that of experience, having intellectual conclusion are signs or symbols having no intrinsic quality of their own, but standing for things that may in another experience be qualitatively experienced. So in other words, if you're a scientist and you're using mathematical formulae or equations, say you're a physicist, these symbols, these formulae that you're writing down on your notebook and you're you know, working out in your, your paper, they stand for something else, right? They stand for something actual, right? They're a symbolic marker, okay? But the material of the fine arts, as Dewey puts it, consists of qualities, okay? Unlike the intellectual, we're dealing with symbols that stand for things that might actually, you know, if you understand what the, the you know, Newton's laws are, and, and you're a really good physicist, you can use your imagination to sort of understand you know, picture in your mind them at work, in reality, in experience. But in art, it's direct, right? Art itself presents the experience directly. This is key for Dewey, right? Remember the title of his book, Art as Experience. So the difference, he says, is enormous, and that's the reason why the strictly intellectual art will never be popular as music is popular, right? You know, we have to understand the symbols and what they stand for to really appreciate the truths and maybe the aesthetic appeal of physics or mathematics, whereas art is direct, right? It gives itself directly to us and we either get it or we don't. <clears throat> and we don't have to have it explained if we get it. What is even more important is that not only is this quality a significant motive in undertaking intellectual inquiry and keeping it honest, but that no intellectual activity is an integral event, in other words, is an experience, unless it's rounded out with this quality. He's talking about the quality of coming to a conclusion, accumulation, something like this. Without it, thinking is inconclusive. 
In short, aesthetic cannot be sharply marked off from intellectual experience since the latter must bear an aesthetic stamp to be itself complete, right? So while we, we tend to distinguish between, you know, some intellectual in, you know, some library reading, read, reading a book, trying to come to a conclusion about some metaphysical, uh, you know, some metaphysical truth, or some epistemological truth about, about knowledge. Um, we don't imagine an artist. We don't, we don't think of that as aesthetic, right? That's not something we uh, normally associate with the term aesthetic experience. But do we say here that it could be, it, if it, it uh, results in insight, right? If at the end of this contemplation and this, this intellectual engagement with the philosophical text or a mathematical problem, if it results in some conclusion and some realization and understanding and, and, and an end result, it's aesthetic. Right? It still counts as aesthetic for uh, for Dean. Now, practical activity. This is where it gets tricky, right? Practical activity for Dewey is not aesthetic. It's in a sense unesthetic um, for the most part. I mean, this really is only if, like in the intellectual activity of thinking there's no resolution there's no accumulation right it's just this monotonous endless process right in that case practical activity would not be aesthetic either the same statement holds good of course of action that's dominantly practical that is one that consists of overt doings it's possible to be efficient in action and yet not have a conscious experience, right? Like these ladies here in the factory, right? They might be so used to the movements of, you know, packaging all these Twinkies into their packages. They're not even really consciously thinking. They might even think about other things completely elsewhere and their body is just going through the motions mechanically, right? The activity here is too automatic to permit of a sense of what it is about and where it is going. It comes to an end but not to a close or consummation in consciousness, right? These ladies are, might get, get to the end of their shift and go clock out and, and, and end the day, but they're always going to have to come back tomorrow. There'll be more Twinkies to put in more boxes, to, you know, more conveyor belts. It's an endless, there's no consummation. Obstacles are overcome by shrewd skill, but they do not feed experience. There are also those who are wavering in action, uncertain and inconclusive, like the, like the shades in classical literature. Between the poles of aimlessness and mechanical efficiency, right? So that, that'd be one extreme, right? These ladies here, that's mechanical efficiency, right? They're so good at their job. They do it so well. It's such a simple task. They just, just knock it out without thought. And then there's the other, the other extreme of just aimlessness, you know, completely just kind of do-do-do-do, kind of like the kids in the classroom here, in, in that, that first photo we saw, right? Just not really much direction at all, right? So between those two poles, right? Between those two extremes, um, there lie those courses of action in which through successive deeds, there runs a sense of growing meaning, conserved and accumulating toward an end that is felt as accomplishment of a process, right? So again, there's that accomplishment, that resolution, that accumulation. That's another word he likes to use um, quite a bit. So for him, any, any practical activity will, provided that it's integrated and moved by its own urge to fulfillment, have aesthetic quality, right? So anything, you know, this kid on a skateboard, right? Maybe he was practicing doing that wheelie and flipping that. What is that? Is that's a, I forgot the name of this, the term for this trick, right? Uh, is it a double wheelie or a, just a wheelie with a twist? It's a pretty tough thing to do. This kid probably practiced over and over again, falling and scraping his knees. Finally, he's able to, to perform this with skill, accuracy. For Dewey, this is an example of an aesthetic activity. Has, this activity may be practical. He's using his body to do something physical. And, you know, you can maybe see how, I don't know, this might be something you need to do if you're a skater going through the city and looking and jumping over curves and stuff. I don't know. But anyway, it has an aesthetic quality if it reaches this, this point of accumulation, sorry, accumulation and fulfillment. Okay? In a way, you might say that you, these ladies, maybe not them because they do this for a living, but let's say you went to the factory um, just for one day 
and work their job, right? And like maybe the first hour or two, you were like really sloppy and slow and they had to, they had to like slow the machine down so that you were able to keep up with the Twinkies coming out of the conveyor. Um, but then after the first hour or two, you got the hang of it and you kind of got into the mechanical mode that they're in. And then you went home for the day and you never, ever, ever worked at a Twinkie factory again for the rest of your life. I would argue that maybe that itself would be, would count as an experience, right? Because you were just like a curious observer. I don't know, maybe like you're a reporter trying to figure out what it's like to be a factory worker for some human interest story, right? Then you could talk about my experience of being a Twinkie factory worker or something like this, okay? Uh, but if you're, again, a, a mundane worker that's doing this day in, day out or something like this, this is what he's talking about. This is where certainly this is not an activity Activity, like it would be for this kid who, again, you know, practiced hard and, and, and worked his, you know, through, through, through trial and error. And finally, you know, he's able to perform this trick with skill and accuracy, right? That would be for him, uh, certainly uh, for Dewey and activity, right? And then there's like, there's, you know, what we've been talking about so far, these are unesthetic as opposed to aesthetic. And then there's the anesthetic. I kind of love this. It's like the zombie mode of experience, right? So um, he says, in much of our experience, we're not concerned with the connection of one incident with what went before and what comes after. There's no interest that controls attentive rejection or selection of what shall be organized in the developing experience. I think this is a lot like just surfing your social media, right? You, you know, it's just, you're just scrolling through. There's really nothing that grabs you though. That's interesting. Next though, that's, and there's nothing that's connecting one story in your feed to the other, besides the fact that there are things you've liked or friends you follow. Things happen, but they're neither definitively included nor decisively excluded. We drift. There is experience, but so slack and discursive that it is not an experience. Needless to say, such experiences are an aesthetic. And then for him, I love these, these drawings by Steve Cutts. I, I, they might get offensive to some people, but I think they're kind of hilarious. I thought this was a great a great uh, sort of cartoon representation of kind of what he's talking about here. The enemies of the aesthetic. It's, it's neither the practical nor the intellectual, right? He's talked about how even practical activities and intellectual activities can be aesthetic in a certain sense, right? So they're not the enemies of the aesthetic, okay? What are the enemies of the aesthetic? For him, they are the humdrum, slackness of loose ends, submission to convention in practice and intellectual procedure, rigid abstinence, coerced submission, tightness on one side and dissipation, incoherence and aimless indulgence on the other. These are deviations in opposite directions from the unity of an experience, right? So it's just sort of, you know, it's this apathetic almost malaise uh, that he's talking about here when, when we're talking about the enemies of the aesthetic, right? Even something as mundane as trying to solve a math problem can be aesthetic if you struggle with it and then you find the solution and there's this sort of satisfaction about it that himself is a sort of form of aesthetic experience uh, for Dewey, right? If I'm just sitting here watching my programs, eating my KFC, smoking my cigarette, not even really thinking about it, right? This is Roger Rabbit and Jessica Rabbit, <laughs> way after their glory days, I suppose. <clears throat> there has to be some tension, right? That's what this involves for Nietzsche, for, uh, for Dewey, right? I keep, I keep wanting to say Nietzsche because there's, there's so many ways in which their thought, I think, overlaps. Same thing with Heidegger and Dewey, right? But again, uh, for Dewey, there's something essential about strife that brings about the possibility for the aesthetic, right? So there's an element of undergoing, of suffering in its large sense in every experience. Otherwise, there could be no taking in of what preceded. For taking in in any vital experience is something more than placing something on top of consciousness over what was previously known. So we're not just like adding to our store of knowledge when we encounter something new. We're not just adding something to, you know, like, like some computer with a hard drive, adding a bunch of facts. What it involves, he says, it's a reconstruction, right? It's a reintegrating of all our previous experiences into the present, right? It involves a reconstruction, and this is the key to this quote, it, it may be painful, right? 
and whether the necessary undergoing phase is by itself pleasurable or painful is a matter of particular conditions. It's not always painful. It is indifferent to the total aesthetic quality, say that there are few, very few, intense aesthetic experiences that are wholly gleeful. This is, I think, something that's fascinating to me about Dewey, and it's a good way to answer the problem we've seen throughout this course, throughout all these philosophers. Some of, their, some of them, I, mean, I don't want to say all of them, but some of them deal with this correctly. And I think Nietzsche does this pretty well. You could argue that, that perhaps uh, Schopenhauer and Kant deal with it pretty well. Uh, I don't think it would be very good for Hume. Hume's got a problem with this. This idea that, a, that the aesthetic experience always has to be pleasant. I mean, certainly, you know, certainly you have experiences of works of art, uh, movies, uh, plays, dramas, things like this that are very unpleasant, that make you cry or feel uncomfortable, but they, they're great works of art. In fact, that's why they're great works of art, right? So, you know, for Dewey, he points this, this out. He says, well, that's because experience itself has this strife. And, and, and so, in a sense, Aesthetic experience is aesthetic experience is always going to have it to some extent. It's not going to be wholly gleeful. You might think that he's wrong about this. You might start thinking of examples of art. You know, maybe you go see a Disney movie and you want to say, "I saw that Disney movie and it was completely joyful. It was just a fun experience." But he might push back and say, even something as silly and like child, you know, some G-rated thing like a Disney movie it's going to have moments of strife and you're going to have resolution and conflict of some sort, right? You know, finding Nemo, they got to find Nemo, right? As cute and fun as that movie is, there's tension, right? So they're certainly not to be characterized as amusing. They're not just amusing. And as, as they bear down upon us, they involve a suffering that is nonetheless consistent with, and indeed a part of, the complete perception that is enjoyed. Again, so there has to be some sort of tension uh, and then resolution, obviously, for the aesthetic to occur in our experience. Now, we talked already about emotions. We, we, we talked about um, how emotions in our environment are intrinsically tied, right? Inextricably tied. But how do the emotions relate to experience in this context? Well, he kind of repeats a bit of what he's already said before about the emotions. So let's just sort of read this quote here and we'll see how this is a bit of a, maybe an elaboration on what's gone before. He says, we're, we're given to thinking of emotions as things as simple and compact as are the words by which we name them. So we assume that emotions are simple, compact, just like things like the words that we use, joy, sorrow, hope, fear, anger, curiosity. These are treated as if each in itself were a sort of entity that enters into, sorry, enters full, made upon the scene. Enters full, made upon the scene. An entity that may last a long time or a short time, but whose duration, whose growth and career is irrelevant to its nature. In fact, emotions are qualities when they are significant of a complex experience that moves and changes. So Dewey is saying here that emotions are not just these separate entities that we attach to certain things that just pop up on the scene. For him, emotions pervade the entire experience, right? They are qualities of a complex experience that moves and changes, right? The intimate nature of emotion is manifested in ex the experience of one watching a play on the stage or reading a novel. It attends the development of a plot. And a plot requires a stage, a space, wherein to develop and time in which to unfold. Experience is emotional, but there are no separate things called emotions in it, right? So when I feel sad, for instance, that sadness colors my world. The world appears sad to me. As silly as it sounds, if I'm sad, I look at the desk and it's a sad, depressing desk, right? If I look at the piece of paper, it's a depressing piece of paper, right? These objects that are completely inert and have really no quality in themselves, except the sort of what I color them with, you know, if I'm sort of a Dewey pragmatist or a Heideggerian, um, 
and I'm sad. It colors my, my perception of my experience, right? It's, it's a, it's not just some, some object out there that I can point to and separate from other objects of my experience as something separate, but it's this full coloring, this tint, right? It's almost like I put on, you know, rose colored glasses to use that expression. That's the happy, right? I put on the blue color because I'm sad, right? Again, and it's something that is um, pervasive of the experience itself, not detached or separate or just some small element of it. By the same token, emotions are attached to events and objects in their movement. They are not, save in pathological instances, private. This is kind of a, Sounds like a crazy theory, but in a sense, you know, what he's saying, there's, he's got, there's something to it. Um, we often think of emotions as private, subjective, right? When I'm sad, um, I'm the one who's sad. You don't have my sadness. Um, and that's true in certain cases, right? But you might think of other times when you're like at a party, having a great time. There's a certain mood. There's a vibe to use that more like, I guess, contemporary term, um, there's a vibe to the party, an aura to the party, and uh, it sort of pervades the party. And, and it's, it's not private because it's a part of the environment, and it's something that all of us as party goers are, can tap into. We can all feel it, and we all know that we feel it. And even if there's some dude at the party who's in the corner who's not feeling it, we, we know he's not a part of it, right? And he can probably, and even him, if, you're, if you are that guy, you can look at us and you know we're feeling that emotion. And so again, I think this is the point that Dewey's trying to make. Emotions aren't private in the sense that we like to think. So they are not, save in pathological instances, private. And even an objectless emotion demands something beyond itself to which it to attach itself. And thus it soon generates a delusion and lack of something real. Emotion belongs of a certainty to the self. So yeah, in a certain sense, of course, when I'm sad, it's me who's sad, but it belongs to the self that is concerned in the movement of events toward an issue that is desired or disliked, right? The emotion is a response and it's even a part of my environment, my experience, right? It's this, this uh, uh, constituent element. It's not something that I, I, I arrive at by reflection, right? We jump instantaneously when we are scared as we blush on the instant when we are ashamed. But fright and shamed modesty are not, in this case, emotional states. Of themselves, they are but automatic reflexes. In order to become emotional, they must become parts of an inclusive and enduring situation that involves concern for objects and their issues. So what's the point that he's making there in the second half of the quote? That's pretty vague. What he says here about, um, you know, jumping instantaneously when we're scared. This reminds me a bit of Jean-Paul Sartre in Being in Nothingness. He talks about emotions like shame. And, and Sartre, obviously, he is very influenced by the work of Heidegger. I've already talked many times. I keep dropping Heidegger's name. A lot of parallels between Dewey, I think, and Heidegger here. Uh, but yeah, emotions are not something that we arrive at by reflection, right? When you do something and you're caught doing it, it's something you should be ashamed of. You don't have to think, oh, you know, he's looking at me. What I'm doing is shameful. Oh no, now I'm ashamed. No, it's instantaneous. It's like a reflex, okay? And so when we use emotions in a way that's conscious, when we're using them in a way where we see them as emotions and we separate them from the environment, he says, that means that it involves a concern for the objects that's different and their issues, right? It, it involves a sort of awareness a conscious awareness and a manipulation, right, of the environment, right? And a channeling, perhaps, of those emotions, um, you know, in artistic expression, if you're an artist, or I guess in an emotional outburst, if you're like one of us, okay? But a little bit more on emotions. We're almost done with this video, but let's wrap up chapter two, okay? Emotion is the moving and cementing force. It selects what is congruous and dyes what is selected with its color, thereby in giving qualitative unity to materials externally disparate and dissimilar, right? So it gives an order to my, my world, right? Again, if I'm sad, everything appears as sad to me. All these objects that are separate, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I notice them 
insofar as they are a reflection of my sadness, right? Or my happiness, right? In this picture, obviously these guys, you know, you got LeBron James here and they have, they, they just won their championship and they're, you know, overcome with joy and emotion, right? And this, this emotion, again, it's a communal of joy. They all are celebrating, they all feel it, they all know it. Um, and so it provides a unity in and through the very parts of an experience. So emotion gives a sort of whole, a completeness, a unity to experience. It draws in all these parts together. And when the unity of the sort already described, sorry, when the unity is of the sort already described, the one he's been talking about throughout the book, you know, this unity of cohesion and accumulation and all the stressful things in the environment are dealt with and overcome. You know, when that's the case, you know, even though it's not dominantly an aesthetic experience, he says it has an aesthetic character, right? So even though you might not think of a basketball game as, as an aesthetic, you know, work of art, right? It's not thought of it as aesthetic experience. If, it, if it's overcome with these feelings of emotion and unity and the crowd is, you know, the fans are in with it and they're, they're excited too. And it, it's, it's after this long drawn fought, you know, drawn out, fought uh, hard for, uh, I can't talk all of a sudden. This is the last uh, uh, lecture I'll be giving for the day because I'm completely out of steam, right? You could probably tell just by the tone of voice <clears throat> that I'm using, right? But again, right, this basketball game has a sort of aesthetic character because of its, its completion, right? It's, it's, it's the end of the series. It's, it's through, through pain and trial and error and struggle and losing games and winning some and bad moves and good moves, overcoming, right? And this is what gives it this sort of aesthetic quality for, for Dewey, right? And this is for him what makes art so much better than uh, other modes of thinking and thought like social science when it comes to explaining human emotion and human experience. And, you know, we're already over, you know, maybe like 45 minutes into the video here. So I think I'm actually going to start the next video here on this slide. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of wrap up chapter two at the very beginning of the next video. I know I said I'd finish it, but you know how I am. I go off on these tangents and I get all, you know, bound up and worked up and excited and you know, the video that I wanted to be 20 minutes is now 45 minutes. And you're probably like, geez, move on, Professor Ross. Let's get into some nitty gritty stuff. We will. All right. Next video, we're getting into the third chapter. We're going to talk about artistic expression and what it means to be expressive in general. And uh, I think it's fine that we have a few more slides here to go to wrap up chapter two, because this will be a good segue, I think, to that topic. All right. So. Um, I want to thank everybody for sticking around. Uh, if you're one of my students at U of H, you kind of have to stick around for this. Just watch this for fun. Thanks again. Hit subscribe if you want to be updated for uh, when more videos are posted. And there's a lot more Dewey to come. I think we got at least another four or five videos before we wrap things up with uh, John Dewey. And we're going to move on to Martin Heidegger's work, The Origin of the Work of Art. And I'm excited about that. Big Heidegger fan. Um, so that should be pretty cool. Uh, so I hope you stick around for that one as well. And thanks for doing this. See you on the other side. Cheers.